You're listening to the official podcast of Asbury University, produced by students with God-honoring conversations that inform, edify, and encourage. This is Asbury. We explore culture and current topics through a Christian worldview, promoting a well-balanced life, and we empower our community to belong, become, and be set apart. I'm your host, Abby Lobb. Welcome to This is Asbury. I'm Paul Nesselrode, professor of psychology and director of the honors program here at Asbury University. It's my incredible privilege to sit down with author, professor, and podcaster, Dr. John Dixon. Currently, he serves as a Gene Kwame, distinguished professor of biblical studies and public Christianity at Wheaton College. He's also the host of a wonderful podcast entitled Undeceptions. This is a podcast I've become a big fan of. I would encourage any of our listeners to check it out. The topic selection, the value of the information that is shared, and the production quality is simply fantastic. John is here at Asbury as a guest of the Honors Program. For anyone who's interested, a recording of his talk to the campus can be found on the Asbury University Honors Program webpage. John, thanks so much for giving us a few moments of your time today. Thank you, Paul, and thanks for those nice, warm comments. I already feel at home. Getting right to a few questions here. In several of your productions and writings, you encourage us to consider the gospel as a tune that Jesus taught us to play. You help us understand how down through the last 2,000 years of church history, the tune has sometimes been played exceptionally well, and other times not very well. When you look back at the wrong notes, the dissonant chords played out across Christian history, have you found any common themes that seem to run through a lot of these more lamentable episodes? With history, it's always hard to tie them up in a bow and say, here is the key to the historical mistakes of the church. But that's not to say there aren't some overarching or recurring ideas as I think about the 5th century riots in Alexandria, where Christians pulled down pagan statues, destroyed the greatest temple in Egypt, and then murdered the greatest pagan philosopher in Alexandria. Or you rush forward to the way Christians joined Clovis, the the great uh, Merovingian king, who was a recent convert in around 500. As he kept on conquering new tribes across Gaul, the church went with him, asking him to let them sort of follow up behind the army and establish monasteries in the new places he'd conquered. Uh, Through to, say, Charlemagne in the 8th century, who had a full-blown Christian jihad which is what some scholars call it, where he literally said to the Saxons, you either get baptised or I kill you with the sword. It's your choice. So as I, you know, I think through some of those low points, what's the recurring thing? It's, It's as if they have forgotten, not that Christ is Lord, because that's almost the driving principle. It's that they've forgotten what kind of Lord Christ is. And through the Gospels, it is so clear, and in the Pauline epistles and Petrine epistles, it's so clear this Lord conquers through service and suffering. And the whole arc of the Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, is that this is the Lord, no doubt, the Lord of all things, but he came to die and that his glory, in the terms John's Gospel will use, his glory is revealed when he is crucified. You get the same theme in Revelation, which at one level is the most violent text in the Bible. It's even more violent than the book of Joshua. But the theme at the heart of this apparent violence is actually the upending of violence because what it's depicting is the victory of the lamb who has been slain. And there's that gorgeous scene. There's the disclosure of the Lord of heaven and earth and it's the lion of Judah. And then then John says, and I looked and I saw a lamb on the throne looking as though he had been slain. That's the key that unlocks the book of Revelation. So my, my point is, I'm sorry I'm, I'm being a little bit long-winded, but as I think through these sort of violent, imperialistic acts through church history, they've not tied the lordship of Christ to his willing sacrifice for others. That that's the mode of his victory, death. And consequently, you know, the, the beautiful times in church history are when Christians remember that. Well, that was the flip side of the question is if in fact the times when you look back from the benefit of our perspective and see that the tune's been played exceptionally well and we can reflect on that, I imagine it's that same issue perhaps. 
the word power comes to mind, or is it a different way of understanding power, or is power just a word that's poisonous and really is a different way of thinking about a lordship, as you say? I've tried to think through the idea of power over the years, and, and I used to think, yeah, the problem is power. Whenever you give Christians power, it's bad. But actually, I don't think that's the case, because I think of the, the fourth century, the greatest Christian leaders of the fourth century are people like Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, and they were elites. They were all from very wealthy families. They were highly educated. Basil was a star student of the Academy of Athens, one of the most famous schools, and sort of rose up to be the bishop. He could have been the, the chief imperial advisor. I mean, there's some evidence that actually Emperor Julian wanted Basil in his court. He, he was so talented. But these guys, Basil and Gregory, actually threw themselves into serving others. So here they are with earthly power, but shaped by the cross, if I can put it like that. They, no less than Constantine or Clovis or Charlemagne, thought Jesus was Lord, but they thought he was a Lord who demonstrates his rule in the world through service. So Basil starts the first hospital in world history, an idea that, that catches on and explodes through Europe. Within a few hundred years of Basil starting the first public hospital, you've got thousands of hospitals, all of them rung by churches. And so that's how he thought power should be used. Gregory of Nyssa preached what we think might be the first full abolitionist speech in world history. In his diocese, which is thousands of people. There's no way you could have owned a slave with his kind of preaching. You were going to hell if you owned a slave because the slave is made in the image of God. Here are people with power who redirect power for the good of others. That's the key. That's the beautiful melody, actually. And I think this tension is everywhere in Christian history and in the Christian life. We're holding together two ordinarily contradictory things. Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth and He's the servant of all, gave himself on a cross. So if you just emphasize his lordship, you end up with a kind of perverse imperialistic approach to Christianity if you're forgetting his sacrifice. But if you forget that he's lord and just go, you know, just go with his sacrifice, you end up with the version of Christianity Nietzsche hated. Friedrich Nietzsche criticized Christianity as introducing this sort of perverse anti-value, the transvaluation of values that is just the beaten down dog ethic. You beat a dog often enough and it's just submissive. And he said that's what early Christianity was. But he's missing that those earliest Christians, yes, knew that Jesus had been crucified, but they also knew he was the Lord. So it gave the early Christians, and the evidence of this is overwhelming, an incredible confidence. They could throw themselves into every debate get beaten up or worse, and smile sweetly and bless their persecutors precisely because they held in beautiful tension that Jesus was the crucified Lord and he was the Lord. If you just go with a sort of humble Jesus and we just we just get beaten up and that's just our, that's our lot, you just, you'll be depressing. And that's not what I'm advocating. These early Christians had this weird combination of supreme confidence, almost arrogance in many early Christian texts, but combined with a willingness to suffer and bless persecutors that is shocking. And it only comes when you can hold these two things together of his lordship and the nature of his lordship in the cross. As you're talking, I think one of your chapters in your most recent book, Bullies and Saints, is entitled Good Losers. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So yeah. you're yeah. capturing that. And I'm not advocating that we should all be losers. I'm just right. saying they were trying to win everything. Right. And they were winning. People were win being coming to the faith left, right and centre. But they were also doing a lot of social losing in, in as much as they were being arrested, they were being killed, they were being excluded from academic centres, excluded from imperial roles, um, at various times, you know, mass persecution. So they were losing. But but when they lost, they lost well. And, and it left people going, why are they, why are they like that? Mm -hmm. And we have, we have Christian texts, whether Tertullian or Lactantius, that say explicitly that the, the way Christians die is one of the most compelling things about Christianity to the wider pagan world. It causes people to go away and investigate Christianity. I have a follow-up question here where instead of sort of looking back and trying to understand history, let's ask, what does it tell us now in this current cultural moment? I'm sensing that we're going to be dancing along the same theme here, but let me just do that. So when you think about what advice does Christian history give to us in the here and now regarding this current cultural moment? Christians in their desperation to fit into culture can compromise the ethics of Christianity. There are some classic examples of this in the ninth century. We have a text called the Helian, which is a retelling of the four Gospels in Old Saxon 
epic style that retells the story of Jesus and his disciples as a warrior epic. And Jesus is the Lord Knight and the apostles are his war band. And even the Sermon on the Mount is recast in this to basically talk about being a just warrior. So the author of the Hellier was trying to reach Saxon culture using the language of Saxon warrior tradition in order to get them to take Christianity seriously. But in the process of trying to convert the culture, Christianity itself was converted. I think we can see that over and over again through church history. And I think we can see it today. When the church is desperate for relevance, desperate to be in the media, desperate to have political sway. What very often happens is we compromise our core value to have a seat at the table. Instead of the cheerful confidence of the good loser that says, look, I, if I'm invited to the table, fantastic. And I'll say whatever needs to be said. I'm not shy because Christ is Lord, but I'm, I'm not going to compromise. And I'm certainly not going to compromise with power. I'm going to use power for the sake of others always. If I'm handed power, my first question will be, how can I use that for those who don't have power? That's going to be the question of the of the of the Christian. And and in that mode, Christianity works wonderfully. I'm not pacifist. I'm not someone who thinks we should get out of politics, quite the opposite. But the way politics should be done in Christ's name is through persuasion, service and suffering. And that means willing to lose and lose well even if what you're actually trying to do is persuade. One last thing that I, I think history offers us is it makes us aware of our blind spots, or at least it has the potential to show us our blind spots. Because when you first hear of Charlemagne having a Christian jihad against the Saxons, your first thought might be, oh, how could he ever do that when he claims to be a Christian? But really the thought should be, I wonder what my blind spot is that I can't see. Because here's Charlemagne who couldn't see a blind spot. I wonder what mine is. More controversially, when we look at sort of 19th century slaveholders and we think, how, how could they have done that? They can't have been Christians. Our first thought ought to be, I wonder what my blind spot is. What will Christians 200 years from now say about 21st century evangelicalism in Australia or the US? Will they look back on us and wonder if we were actually Christians? Maybe this leads to my last question in this theme, because if we'll take this history seriously, it will help us to ask this question, which if we're not a student of history, perhaps we, we won't even think to ask it. So I'm sure that you get this question a lot, and that is the why question. Why, when the surrounding culture is increasingly suspicious of the claims of, of Christianity, why should we r remind ourselves of some of the most unflattering chapters in Christian history? Shouldn't we be circling the wagons right now? That's a, I think you probably have been confronted with that. Some of my friends, when my book came out, thought I'd let the team down by airing the dirty laundry. You shouldn't do that. You're just jumping on the left-wing progressive anti-church bandwagon, Dixon. My response is, one is just a plain historical response. These are facts. You may not want the facts to get in the way of narrative, but <laughs> that's, you know, I, I'm a historian. This is my professional training. I, I can't cruise through the 4th and 5th century without noting the amazing Christian riots that led to murders in Christ's name. So there's a historical reply. But actually, I have a theological reply, and that is, it was Jesus who said to his disciples, take the log out of your eye. Take the plank out of your eye, you hypocrite. Right? Now, that's not to the Pharisees, he said this. He said this to his disciples. And I think right there in this idea of a plank in the eye of the church is the theological justification for being honest about all the blind spots, the spots that have the plank <laughs> you know, blocking our eyesight. This comes from Jesus. And if we are willing to acknowledge our fault and the fault of some otherwise spectacular Christians, if we're willing to acknowledge the fault, we're more likely to self-correct. I think that saying about take the plank out of your eye is the self-corrective mechanism that weaves its way through all of church history. Because at the very point when things are darkest, some, someone somewhere pipes up, like during the reign of Charlemagne, one of his courtiers, Alcuin of York, a deacon of the church, spectacular theologian, wrote two letters to the court of Charlemagne, begging them to go back to the old way of persuasion, not the way of violence and taxation to make people Christian. Um, and he seems to have had an effect because the, the next year Charlemagne changed the laws about the treatment of Saxons. So here's a perfect example of a Christian spotting the plank and yelling about it and reforming. So I think we will be a better church a purer church if we allow ourselves and allow others to find the planks, point them out, 
And collectively, we can turn from those things, we can lament about those things, and we can take the plank out of our eye and see clearly, is what Jesus says. That requires a mature Christian attitude towards one's faith, doesn't it? And a confidence. Because if you're brittle about your Christian faith, you're not going to want anyone to look at the bad things. But if you're super confident about it, you go, well, you can look at the bad things because I don't think it affects the glory of Christ. As we finish, you seem to be so incredibly active. Other than demands of the podcast on deceptions, are you working on anything else that we should be on the lookout for in the future? Well, I should mention that I do actually teach at Wheaton. In college, just in case there are any Wheaton people listening, I, I am at the college often and I do teach classes and it's a great joy. But in terms of projects, yeah, look, I'm working on a really fun thing that, that brings my former music career back <laughs> from the distant past and combines it with, with my historical love. We're filming a documentary called The First Hymn Project. It is literally about the resurrection of the oldest Christian hymn ever discovered, complete with musical notation. It's from the 200s AD. It was found in a rubbish dump in Egypt. It sits in a vault in Oxford now. But it's one page from the middle of the third century. So we're we're 80 years before the Council of Nicaea. And it declares the glory of the Trinity, praising the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and declaring this one God, the giver of all good gifts. Amen, amen, it says. Right. So it's a beautiful lyric written in ancient Greek, but above each syllable, is the note you're to sing. So we actually know the melody. And the melody is a little bit weird, I must say, because it's nearly 2,000 years old. But we've engaged two of the top Christian songwriters in the world, in Ben Fielding and Chris Tomlin, to take that melody, to take my translation of the lyric and turn it into a modern praise song. So we are filming that whole process. They're writing, they're recording. We've filmed scenes in Egypt where, where the document was found, interviewed scholars about it. So it's both a little bit of a nerdy history documentary and a little bit of like a song exploder, you know, the making of a song. And then we're filming a final performance. So we're filming this. It's going to end up four half-hour episodes. Lord willing, it'll appear on some one of, one of the streaming services. But we're, we're away off that. We, we think we're probably about a year, so maybe around Easter 25, away from doing it. But, boy, it's fun. And to give this song back to the church... A song that hasn't been sung for 1,800 years is a, is a joy to be part of. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that exciting bit of news. And th- thank you for your time this morning and the benefits of your thoughts. Blessings on you and your work. Thank you once again. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of This is Asbury. To learn more about Asbury University, visit asbury.edu. 